The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. As a youngster, Stephen Jay Gould's fascination with the natural world earned him the nickname Fossil Face from his schoolmates. He loved the Hall of Dinosaurs at New York's Museum of Natural History. And his mother says her son spent childhood trips to the beach dividing shells into three categories, regular, extraordinary, and unusual. Over the years, Gould has parlayed his passion into a distinguished career as a scientist, teacher, and writer. His newest book, Dinosaur in a Haystack, is the seventh collection of the monthly essays he's written for Natural History magazine for more than 20 years, a practice he plans to continue into the next century, making Gould to borrow a hero from a sport he holds dear to his heart, the Cal Ripken of SAS. Welcome to Upon Reflection. I mean, I have to write 2,130 <laughs> plus of them? Oh. Well, that's what you said you want to do. <laughs> as an essayist, you work as a translator of sorts, a bridge between science and, and the lay public. In the introduction to this book, you say that this is an old tradition, but one that is for all intents and purposes effectively lost. I wanted you to talk about the people, the models you had in this tradition, the people who are your inspirations, and tell us why this is an endangered species of sorts. Well, the original model is Galileo, who wrote his two great books, not in the formal Latin of churches and universities, but he wrote them as dialogues in Italian between a teacher himself and uh, two students. One is the Aristotelian fall guy named Simplicio. <laughs> He's Professor Salviati. But the idea of writing one's technical works in such a way that general public could read them is a very old and honorable tradition. Darwin's books were all written for general readership, and yet they transformed the scientific world. In that sense, I don't really see myself as translating science for the lay public. That's one of the effects of them. But I wouldn't write these essays any differently if they were only for my scientific colleagues. I, I just see the tradition that I see myself as working in as a part of humanism. That is to explain science as part of the humanistic arts. It goes back to Galileo. It certainly goes into the 19th century, as I said, with Darwin, Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, Huxley's essays. They're, they're all major works that transform their sciences, but they were written for general readers. That's pretty much gone because science has become such a specialized enterprise with so many journals and such a jargon that almost all scientific work is now written only for consumption by scientists <laughs> and usually not very well. And then we've gotten a kind of science popularization, mostly in this country more than in Europe, that truly is overly simplified and adulterated and has given the whole enterprise a bad name. What I'd like to do is rediscover, and it's never really been lost. There have been people like J.B.S. Haldane and P.B. Medawar. Uh, in England, or Lou Thomas, or uh, Lauren Isley in this country who've kept it up, the notion that you could write literate, serious prose about science. One of the effects of reading this book of essays, and I, w I was sitting in a library on the campus of the university reading the book, reading about the myth of the, of the flat earth myth, and I, it was almost as though I could hear Frank Zappa's voice saying, everything you know is wrong. And the question I was, why, why is so much of what we think we know about natural history wrong? Because humans are storytelling creatures and stories only go in certain ways and many of the ways that we love stories to go. Things getting better, things making sense, making are really not the, not the way the world works. 
<laughs> and so I think we have imposed upon the world's messiness, the world's randomness, the world's frequent senselessness, I'm not saying it's always senseless, this hope and dream that things would be progressive, sensible, meaningful, lead to us, that as human beings is the highest form of life. Because we have these hopes, and nature really doesn't work that way, we tend to get a lot of things wrong. In the case of, the, of Flat Earth, this was an essay you were talking about, really a timeless tension between science and, and faith, religion, and that we ended up with this idea that mobs of people for a very long time thought the Earth was flat, basically because of a PR coup by the scientific side. It's one of the great myths. Again, I think the scientists would like to get across the notion that their enterprise is one that brings the world out of ignorance through the light of truth, and therefore it helps to have certain myths about truly ignorant things <laughs> believed far longer than one ought to have, and especially since another great publicist, namely Christopher Columbus, probably tried to push the same myth, or at least his publicists did in <laughs> centuries later, there has been this notion that most educated people thought the world was flat and that somehow the church supported these notions until the intrepid explorers of the 15th century, putting their lives on the line, sailed west to find the Indies and discovered that uh, the earth is round. In fact, all educated people knew the earth was round from the days of the Greeks and probably before on forward. That knowledge was never lost. I'm not saying that there weren't a certain number of people both then and now who simply not being aware of that knowledge may there may be folk wisdom that says the earth is flat, but intellectuals, learned people always knew the earth was round. In fact, the complaints raised against Columbus were not as mythology holds, that the earth was flat and he'd <laughs> fall, sail off the edge, but that the earth was much bigger than he thought it was and that therefore he couldn't reach the Indies by sailing west. And you know what? They were right. <laughs> Columbus cooked his data. Columbus argued that the earth's circumference was much smaller than it actually is. And his opponents were correct. He didn't reach the Indies. He reached someplace else interesting with portentous consequences. But uh, they, everybody knew that earth, earth was round. One of the, the great skills that you have is as a connector, you find a detail, extrapolate it out, connect it with other things that are going on. I wondered if you could describe the process that you go through making connections by talking about the theory that, that you and your colleague Niles Eldridge developed in 1972, the one probably most uh, famously attached to you, and that's Punk Eek. I don't know that has much to do with essay connections. Punctuated equilibrium more arose from a particular I'm talking about, just dilemma. about the process of discovery and uh, connections leading to discovery. Uh, that was a long time ago and I don't even remember. I didn't <laughs> know it was going to become a, <laughs> an interesting or important notion at the time. No, we developed punctuated equilibrium because there was uh, a paradox or a dilemma that young paleontologists who wanted to study evolution face, as Niles and I were both graduate students at Columbia, when we started talking about it, we both had spent a lot of time learning statistical methods, fancy statistical methods to study evolutionary sequences, and that's what we wanted to do. But the traditional wisdom of paleontology proclaimed that those sequences were rare to non-existent that you would go out and what you would find are species being quite stable for a long time and then they'd very rapidly in a geological sense change to something else and that was said to be due to the imperfections of the fossil record that evolution really was slow and gradual the only reason it appeared that way is that 99 percent of all the strata are missing and so you don't see the truly gradual transitions that actually exist but think of the dilemma for people who want to study evolution that argument will preserve gradualism but it also tells you there's really nothing to study. You want to study evolution. Evolution means gradual sequences. Gradual sequences don't exist because the fossil record is so imperfect. So what do you do? Niles and I, who had studied evolutionary theory intensely, realized that, in fact, the proper translation of evolutionary theory's ordinary mechanism for speciation into the fossil record would lead to an expectation of long stability and geologically rapid origin of new forms. Geologically rapid can be very slow by the standards of our lives. One bedding plane in geology is usually thousands of years. Now as soon as we realized that this pattern of stability and rapid geological transition 
needn't represent the imperfections of the record, but is in fact a correct prediction of what you ought to find, then we could argue that the fossil record as we see it is available for study and is not merely a record of absent information. That's really where it came from, but then people got interested in it and developed a wider set of implications. Well, the, the, the largest implication was in the, in the development of that theory was that the idea had been things move along slowly and surely, onward and upward, there's always progress, sort of the survival of the fittest, as Darwin said. Your whole notion and one of the ideas that you talk about with, with such great passion is that it's not necessarily the survival of the fittest, but there's a lot of luck involved in that bad things sometimes happen to good organisms. Well, I think it's you need to recognize the differences in time scales. That is the fittest in Darwin's sense, by the way, which is those that are best adapted to local conditions. After all, the morphologically degenerate parasite inside your body or our bodies is just as, uh, as fit as we are to our world. So Darwinian fitness, first of all, has nothing to do with progress, but Darwinian fitness is an immediate or local concept. It doesn't accumulate over time into such patterns as increasing complexification or betterment. That is the fish in a pond, which may be a hydrodynamic marvel of perfection and may have been there for 10 million years, knocking out species after species by virtue of its perfection of design. It's still going to die if the pond dries up. <laughs> so, Immediate local adaptations may represent a survival of the locally best fit, but the accumulation of those through time doesn't build into sensible patterns. That, that's where you, it's, it's that translation to the larger geological time scale that engenders the lack of pattern, the randomness, the contingency, the unpredictability. There have been a number of, not necessarily critics, but, but people who've been very disturbed by this whole notion that what seemed to be such a perfect system um, is actually not, that there's so much chance. And, and one critic who was sitting in a, a lecture you gave at Stanford a, a few years ago, clearly fuming quietly uh, in the audience, uh, harumphed away and said that, you know, your whole, uh, your whole theory that so much luck is involved, so much chance and happenstance, um, leads to a kind of nihilism and despair, and, and uh, no wonder people are so depressed. We aren't necessarily the, the be-all and end-all of that, natural history. I, I think that's really pretty silly because there's nothing about the factual state of the universe or the history of life that is designed in order to give either solace, moral comfort, or meaning to our lives. After all, life was here for three and a half billion years before humans ever emerge. Humans are 250,000 years old. Why should life be constructed <laughs> in such a way to impart meaning to us? In fact, I, I think Darwin's position was very similar to that. I mean, Darwin is sometimes seen as something of a moral midget for holding <laughs> similar views, but that wasn't his view. His, his view was that we are all as moral agents required as human beings to uh, find and struggle towards moral answers for ourselves. But we're not going to find them in the factual state of nature. So if you want to think nature is perfect and that leads you to some lazy notion that maybe you can find moral meaning in nature, that's fine. Darwin's position is you might as well take a cold bath, recognize <laughs> the imperfections, the uglinesses, the randomnesses, and then maybe you'll understand that you shouldn't be looking for the answer to moral questions in the factual state of nature anyway. It doesn't make sense. Hmm. I mentioned in the introduction that you loved the dinosaurs at the American Museum of Natural History when you were a kid. You told a story about bringing your own son there and how things had changed. He was a little more blasé about the dinosaurs than, than you were. And it made me wonder if kids are learning science in a different way than you did when you grew right. up. I don't really know. Science education was virtually non-existent when I was a kid, so it, it can't be worse. I don't think we had any science at all. And I went to the New York City public schools when they were very good. Uh, so I don't think it was any failure of public education. There just wasn't a whole lot of science. There were a few of us who were personally interested. Subway was only a nickel, so we <laughs> went into the museum a lot or up to the Bronx Zoo or whatever. But we were very much self-taught. 
No, my, com my complaint really about dinosaurs, though it may sound somewhat curmudgeonly, is just that they have become such ubiquitous icons of commercial culture that uh, the mystery and fascination that those of us who had to discover them for ourselves once had is unavailable. Now they're on every pencil, cereal box, and uh, lunch pail. So how can they have the same awesome impact upon people. Does that go back to this, the second thing you were talking about when we were talking about the essays? First there's scientists writing to other scientists and then there's this other more popular uh, brand of science education where you, you said it was too watered down, too simplified. Well, some, the, is, some isn't. But are the dinosaurs an example of that, the, the latter category? Well, it, it, again, you have to look on a case-by-case -case basis, often indeed. For instance, these uh, robotic dinosaurs that are so popular, I'm not opposed to them. If you use robotic dinosaurs as a way to bring people into mu your museum and teach them things, show them real bones, that's fine. But too often the robotic dinosaurs just become a theme park exhibit and what fascinates people most are the way they roar and their colors, which are the two things we don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> totally conjectural, not learning any science that way. And I think that is ripping off science. On the other hand, I'm not against uh, pop culture uh, popularization of science. That's great. What about the impact of, of uh, technology? In the section that you write about museums, um, there's such a, a passion about the real thing. You mentioned the Rosetta Stone, for example, and the fact that if you see the real Rosetta Stone, it's just different in and of itself than seeing a replica. And particularly with computers, it's, there seems to be such a fascination with, and maybe satisfaction with at the moment, the virtual experience as opposed to the actual. Up to a point, I think there's something very deep in us that resonates to original objects. It, maybe it's just a cultural phenomenon in this new generation that has grown up in the virtual world won't feel it, but I find that hard to believe because it seems so pervasive. The Rosetta Stone, when you see the real thing, to use your example, it doesn't look any different from a well-crafted replica, at least that I could tell, because I'm not a professional in that field. But I look at it and I know, I know that's the stone that Champollion deciphered. I know that's the stone that the French soldiers picked up in the wall in Alexandria, wherever it was. There's a, there's a history that is an important object in human history. It's the very one. A replica is nice and it's interesting, but it's not that. When I see a dinosaur bone in a museum, which I can tell from a cast, but most non-professionals couldn't. If it's a real hip bone of a Tyrannosaurus, I know there was an animal covering it 70 million years ago that roared and ran through the landscape of the time, and that has a different impact upon me than seeing a fiberglass skeleton. Mm. And I think that will be maintained. Is there anything, any such thing as a pure science that isn't shaped by the time in which it's studied? No, <laughs> because even something that seems so divorced from uh, any empirical reality or social convention like pure mathematics, the very decisions on what's studied, what's popular, is always very much embedded in what people are interested in. Mm. So I was thinking about that in connection with the Human Genome Project. and. You wrote in The Mismeasure of Man a fairly scathing review of sciences which try to shoehorn us into some kind of order or, uh, or put somebody higher in the pecking order than somebody else. It seems every day in that project uh, we read about a new marker being found for something else. There was just a conference last fall at the University of Maryland about the whole possibility of a genetic marker for violence. Is that, I mean, you look at that project, you think of that as a pure science. I mean, they're studying oh, DNA I think, sequencing. I don't think anybody's ever thought of that as a pure <laughs> science project. First of all, you couldn't do it until you had the technology, not only the technology to read nucleotides, but the technology to read them cheaply and in large numbers quickly, because think of how many billions, I don't know how many there are, but there are a lot Lots. of them. So the very fact it's being done now rather than 10 years ago is set in a certain context and it never would have been done or gotten the support unless there were potential medical consequences. So there had to be a very practical reason 
to be involved with that much expense and effort. So no, that's very much a, a big, any big science project because it's so expensive is intimately connected with either good politicking or definite social needs. As to the issue of genetic factors, I'm, I'm not against the notion that there are genes for diseases. Of, of course there are. Or that genetics influences our personality, which is folk wisdom. Every parent who's had more than one child knows that perfectly well. That's really never been an issue. I think what's at issue is the crude notion that there is a violence gene on the 15th chromosome, which if you have it, means you ought to be held in protective detention from day one. I'm exaggerating. For example, there's a report in the New York Times last week about the discovery of a so-called gene. If you read the headline, it said a gene has been discovered for uh, the temperamental desire to have lots of new experiences. It, and then you start reading it and you realize the report is much more subtle. The report says that here's a gene which mediates some effects, which influence about 10% of the variation in thrill-seeking behavior. Now that's a gene that somehow plays into 10% of the information about one temperamental quantity is not the same thing as a gene that specifies this particular characteristic. And, would you put it in the, th the, the project in the, in the same category as people who read Bumps on the Head or, or some of the other uh, biological determinist fields you, no, it's, you it's wrote a, about? The Human Genome Project is, is just an attempt to establish the genetic sequence of human beings. The issue then becomes what you do with it. <laughs> there, there are, as, as with any powerful bit of knowledge, there are ways to misuse it, but I don't think this that is the existence of the human genome problem does not of itself imply biodeterminism. It sure has potentials for being used that way, but by itself it's a potentially important and worthy effort to get a great deal of information about the genetic sequence of a complex organism. Mm. If science is, is affected intimately by the times in which it is done, the issues of those times. What are the issues that affect your work, that shape your thinking as a scientist? Do you mean personally or in any 20th way. century? I've always been interested in evolution. It's hard to know why. I always loved history. I always loved old books. I like talking to my immigrant grandparents. I don't know why do people like one thing and not others. Some people love novelty. I always, I love novelty and ideas, but I like tracing continuities and histories. I love nature also, so I wedded those two interests in history and the nature of life. You know, why do I like baseball? I grew up in New York in the 50s when we had three great teams. <laughs> it wasn't so much what you like or why you do what you do, but how what are, the, what are the great issues of the times? The conflicting notions, the warring notions, the, uh, the intellectual battles that inform well, the work that you do. Well, technically, my technical work is in paleontology, and my main interest there, which is not something that spills out into public debate very often, but is vital in evolutionary theory, is the extent to which evolutionary theory requires the direct study of large-scale events over geological time to understand the workings of evolution. There is a reductionist school which was in the ascendancy up until this 10 or 20 years ago, which held that you really didn't need paleontology at all, that you could pretty much figure out how evolution worked by studying small-scale events occurring in local populations now and extrapolating their results through geological time. You still wanted to study paleontology because it gave you the actual story, but you didn't need it to understand the theory mm. of how life changes. And with punctuated equilibrium and a variety of other particularly paleontological notions that demand long time scales, I think we're coming to a more subtle view that you really do need geological time and paleontology to resolve evolutionary theory. Now that's now that's my technical interest. Why did I write a book like The Mismeasure of Man? That's more a question of seeing the data of your field misused for social purposes that are also alien mm. to you, since I think genetic determinism is a, 
simplistic and incorrect doctrine when I see it used for social purposes that I also despise, I get angry. A uh, friend and a, and a colleague of yours who, who works in this same tradition that you talked about is, is Carl Sagan. He has a new book out um, called The Demon Haunted World, which I must say I haven't had a chance to read uh, but have read descriptions of. And it is a book in which he writes about his concerns of maybe not the misuse of science, but opposition to science in pseudoscience, uh, growth in mysticism, religious fundamentalism. D d are those concerns you share? I mean, are those, are those beliefs uh, any stronger now than at any other time in the past? These are very cyclical. I, this, just, it certainly was... Uh, was distressing to see creationism rise so strongly in the 70s and after we beat it down in the 80s to see it's still around. But I don't know that the 1990s have more irrationalism. You, know, you can go back into the 1890s, which was also a great age of spiritualism and people from, Henry, from Arthur Conan Doyle to Alfred Russell Wallace to the philosopher Henry Sidgwick were all into spiritualism. And, Good, mus good magicians like Harry Houdini were trying to <laughs> show what nonsense it was. So th these things vary, but they're always around, they're always powerful, and they're profoundly scary, anti-intellectual, and uh, they need to be fought by mm. scientists. The very first essay in this book is a wonderful essay about being in New York um, at a time when there was a, an eclipse uh, taking place. And a sentence from that had to do with how wonderful it was that so many different kinds of people were participating in this uh, at the same time. And you said, because after all, what can transcend the barriers that divide us as people? What can? Is there something that you, science can there offer? Are, there are universal phenomena, and science is one of them. I mean, there's, there's nothing class, race, or sex, or in any of the other ways that divide us based about natural knowledge. Now, there are all sorts of ways in which the prejudices allied to those notions influence the way we get knowledge and influence incorrect views that we have. But an eclipse of the sun is an eclipse of the sun. It is <laughs> perceived by all kinds of folks, and it fascinates all kinds of folks. There's something very universalizing about science. I think that all great human achievements are potentially universalized. I think great music and great art and uh, great mm -hmm. sports accomplishments are all properties. They're, they're not achievements of uh, a member of a particular racial group. They're achievements for all of us. Mm -hmm. Stephen Jay Gould, we're out of time. I want to thank you for being a guest on Upon Reflection, your newest book, Dinosaur, in a Haystack. Thank you. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.